First of all, um, thank you all for coming, and thanks to Keith and Rochelle for the invite. Um, I'm just going to give you a short little talk on what we use digital PCR for in our lab, just to uh, help us out with one specific problem. So first of all, one of the big surprises that came out of finding uh, what was in our genome is that we have surprisingly few protein coding genes. We have only 2% of the genome is actually protein coding. So what does this say pertaining to the central dogma? So we have 28,000 genes from 3 billion bases compared to, just as an example, 13,000 genes from 130 million bases in Drosophila. So there's a lot more comparative redundancy uh, in the human genome. This led to the opinion that most of the genome was junk and probably untranscribed, just sitting there, an artifact of evolution. However, as things went on, it became quite obvious that it was transcribed. Um, moreover, we had, we had um, the Phantom Consortium and, uh, and also the ENCODE project revealed that these really are red, and we're even getting uh, antisense transcription um, all over the place. So this must occur at great metabolic cost to the cell. Uh, why would it do it unnecessarily? Here we have uh, the dogma derailed. Not really derailed, but I suppose uh, it's a little strong, but um, guided in a different direction, perhaps. Um, it turns out that many of these RNA sequences are regulatory. Um, they influence um, the transcription of other sequences. And this can happen in a number of ways. We have long non-coding RNAs that can interact with repressive or activating chromatin modifier complexes. This can occur with on the same, within the same chromosome or on a different chromosome. Our lab in particular has found that uh, small RNAs can bind to transcripts which are downstream of 3' gene termini and regulate um, those genes, the transcription of those genes. We've also find that, that small RNAs can bind to the promoter regions, uh, not to the promoter regions, but to antisense transcripts which overlap promoter regions. And these can be shown to upregulate and also downregulate transcription of that specific gene. More recently, um, Chu and another postdoc in the lab and I have found that um, there are lots of microRNAs within the nucleus. So, you know, if they're within the nucleus, then obviously they're, they're acting in a non-canonical role of what we understand microRNAs to do in RNAi. Um, more interestingly, not only are some of them just in the nucleus, some of them are almost solely in the nucleus. Um, also in the nucleus, we find microRNA target sites computationally that do not occur in the cytoplasm. So to take away from this, what I'd like you to, to get a sense of is that there are lots of targets for um, affecting transcription within nuclei of human cells that have hitherto been ignored. Um, so we have long non-coding RNAs that recruit chromatin modifiers, um, promoter-associated RNAs, uh, microRNAs and their nuclear and their nuclear targets. And these targets present an exciting opportunity to impact gene expression in a therapeutic setting. So now, the crux of the talk. Why droplet digital? Well, in order to understand what these transcripts are doing, we want to know how many there are. Um, not only for pharmacokinetics of when things get towards the clinic, but also for indication of potential function. Um, also, as Keith alluded to, or well, didn't allude to, said specifically, Droplet Digital is very good at detecting things that are in extremely low abundance, and some of these transcripts do not occur um, in high abundance. Also, traditional PCR will only give us concentration relative to a reference gene, um, and uh, we work across different cell compartments in which there is no one specific reference gene, and also it doesn't rely on primer efficiency. Because um, some of these long non-coding RNAs are highly structured, and um, and because of that, uh, ampl amplification efficiencies can suffer. Um, so as I already said, uh, real-time PCR needs a normalization. This is a problem for us when comparing across cellular compartments. 
the CT values can change in traditional PCR, and Droplet Digital <coughs> gives us a nice three-step procedure, nice and quick, that can allow for absolute quantification and give us absolute copy. I don't need to go over this. I think uh, I think we understand. But I, I, I guess just very briefly, essentially the, the reaction is um, partitioned into many, many, many 20,000, I guess, uh, monodispersed droplets, and then thermocycled, and the ratio of positive to negative reactions is what gives us our absolute copy number. So we began just by kind of evaluating droplet digital in our own hands against um, regular quantitative PCR. Um, and these data are compiled from uh, multiple primer sets. And we have found that the effective concentration range for a drop of digital is comparable to qPCR, um, which is about uh, CT values of about 18 to 28. And we also published this little chart. Um, the, the most efficient or, or the most precision that we got was at about what you would get in qPCR as a CT of 23. So we have a little adjustment chart in this publication if you want to get the highest precision that, that, that we found in our hands. You can adjust your qPCR to match the digital. So as I said, the effective range of DDPCR is comparable to traditional qPCR. CTs of 1828 corresponds to about 10 to 8,000 copies per microliter. microliter. Works quite well. These deviations, I think, if you notice here, this is, is a little bit of a spread towards the top and the bottom. We believe that's due to uh, different primer sets that are being used and the primer efficiencies changing uh, CT values. So we then went on to compare quantifying uh, non-coding RNA um, by qPCR uh, with droplet digital. So for qPCR, uh, uh, Keith, a postdoc in the lab, did a standard curve for a non-coding transcript um, that is actually promoter associated and, and one that is of uh, prime interest in our lab. And it's, it's a lot of work. It's, well, it's not a lot of work, but it's not necessary. Um, when we compare the data what we got from qPCR to droplet digital, it's essentially the same. Um, I mean, all with an error, it all works out. So the, I guess the, the only difference here is that with the droplet digital, there is no standard curve that you have to do. Um, we then also used it just to make sure that we're getting good cell extract purity. And then we could also uh, determine copy number for that. So for several ongoing projects in the lab, we want to isolate specific cellular compartments. Um, and in order to find the purity of these, uh, these extracts that we get from these compartments, we can look at the expression of uh, known associated RNAs within those compartments. And again, we can do this using droplet digital without the use of a spike in control or creating standard curves. So we did this and we look at some, uh, there's uh, three uh, long non-coding RNAs here. And as we would expect in our chromatin extracts, we see um, high copy numbers as, a pairs, as opposed to um, less in the cytoplasm. Um, hot air uh, is actually found in the cytoplasm, but there, there is literature precedent for this. We were initially surprised by this result, but, um, but there is literature precedent for here. And if you notice the, the abundances of these, uh, of these transcripts, it can imply that these could act in trans, as opposed to if we go back to here at only one and a half copies per cell, you would imagine this, uh, this transcript would have difficulty acting in trans, so therefore likely, likely acts in cis. We, we know it does. Um, also, when I said about the reference genes, you can see that, that there's great variance across the cellular compartments for two common reference genes that are use, used. And this, again, confirmed that we were getting good uh, cell extracts because um, we're having very little gap DH on the chromatin and RPL30 on the chromatin, which is what we expect. So we went on to determine the copy number of um, a few other non-coding RNAs across uh, different cell types. And we did this very quickly, as opposed to 
if we'd have done it traditionally, we would have had to do at least 20 standard curves. I think probably more than that. Um, also worthy of note, I think this is just personal opinion. I'm not sure how much data there is for this out there, but the the data from the standard curves I would tend to trust less because, as I said earlier, that the templates that we use are synthetic in origin. They may lack secondary structures that could affect primer efficiency. Um, Oh, completely switching gears. So our work also, our uh, lab also works on Huntington's disease. And um, Huntington's disease, just to tell you a little bit about it, is a fatal neurodegenerative disorder. Um, about four to 10 people every 100,000. Um, the onset occurs in the mid 30s and it's, a, it's an awful disease. It's always fatal. Now the cause of this dis disease is um, an expanded triplet repeat within a Huntington gene. Um, it's an autosomal dominant disorder, so sufferers have one wild type and one of the expanded alleles, which is important for later. Um, just in determining copy number, copy per cell, um, we had a collaborator that was interested in getting us to do this, so it, it took no time at all. You know, the, the guy wanted to know how many cells he needs to harvest to get this much RNA. So went to the instrument, Got it working, and then you know, same day, uh, got um, absolute copy number for cell data, and this is just for a, a wild type and um, a 69 repeat mutant. But what was interesting about these data is, um, whereas normally you would see two populations of droplets, you would see one positive and one negative, we began to see separation of two, like, like a, a bimodal positive distribution. And if you just kind of hand wavingly draw a line in the middle, um, we believe that these are, these are populations of normal and, and mutant uh, transcript within, the, uh, within distinct droplets. Now this, these, um, well, this, this whole idea needs to be taken a lot further um, because you, I mean, you can agree that where you draw the line is somewhat arbitrary here. Um, but we do think that we're seeing separation of different uh, transcript lengths, which could be interesting for a number of phenomena. So in conclusion, um, you can detect small fold target dif differences, um, determine copy number without an internal standard, uh, or you know, um, creating standard curves, doesn't rely on primer efficiency, and we believe that there's some promise uh, to be able to determine transcript length through the technique also. So that's all I have time for today. Um, thank you all for coming. Thanks to the Cori Lab and um, all the members of the Cori Lab. Specifically, Keith helped me out on this project. And also, uh, Rochelle and, and Keith. And um, Isis Pharmaceuticals and uh, the LSRF for funding me.